Hello, I'm Beryl Dakers. Welcome to Palmetto Scene. We are here in Columbia, just outside the headquarters of the South Carolina Department of Education. As you well know, the COVID-19 pandemic not only wreaked havoc on every aspect of our daily lives, but it also brought swift and dramatic changes to traditional K-12 education in our state. Doors to schools were closed and virtual learning and home learning became the norm. In tonight's episode, we'll take a look at the year in education, starting first with a conversation with State Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman. Madam Superintendent, it's been well over a year now since we've had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. How would you assess the overall impact on our public educational system? Well, first of all, I think overall uh, it's gone reasonably well. Uh, it was a huge learning curve for all of us and it, we were in survival mode those first few months of the end of the school year from March to the end of closing out the the 19 year uh, but as we started then in 19 tw or in 2021 for this this new school year um, we we learned a lot and um, we have measured uh, the imp academic impact uh, it is definitely there uh, in our children many have caught up as they have been back in school and we've accelerated their learning and there are a lot there's still a lot of work that's going to have to be done over this summer and next year in school year and possibly even into the next year to really accelerate to get children back to where they need to be on those grade levels uh, I think a significant impact emotionally uh, social emotionally uh, for the families. The trauma that many of our students have been through with their families is uh, just as significant as the academic impact. So uh, we can talk through the interview but uh, there's a lot to be done and there's lots going on already and there's plans for a lot to happen in the next few months and year. When you talk about the academic impact though, I mean, there are folks who've said that this has really been a lost year, that these kids are mm -hmm. behind. So are we talking about having to factor in and structure literal remediation to bring our students back? For, for some, uh, yes, for some children. And we were very fortunate in South Carolina uh, in our legislative budget that was passed back last summer um, there was some foresight there to say to districts you need to assess your students within 10 days of them returning in August whether they were virtually or in person they we've assessed again in December and that information has to be shared with the Department of Education so we've got data from all schools and a very high rate of participation for the students we have disaggregated that data we've analyzed it sent it back to districts and it shows us the students with mild uh, who will need mild remediation moderate and significant uh, that information has been sent to districts they are already working with students they have already used their federal dollars to hire additional tutors um, working one-on-one -on -one with students small groups but their plans now for extra days this summer uh, enrichment programs not just all academic programs and I think you'll see some districts offering early back to school I think you're going to see a lot of schools looping their teachers uh, the children may stay with the teacher they had this year for the full year or maybe at least till Christmas so there's really valuable use of time rather than getting to know each other <laughs> they already know each other so that that's a strategy that I'm sure we're going to see um, but again I think we're talking about accelerated learning it's not so much learning loss because some of them did not get to the opportunity uh, to ever experience it so it's more about accelerating and pushing students faster quicker um, and uh, more depth for them. This may be a leading question, but does that mean that those students that were disadvantaged to start with perhaps have suffered a greater uh, disadvantage or impact than I those? Think, I think it depends. Uh, you know, from the beginning, we had 15 school districts in August who started full to five days a week. Their children were, there are many children in the state who did not miss 
any days of school other than perhaps being quarantined for a while due to virus spread, but there were 15 of the 79 districts that started like as normal as could be. At least they were offering five days, families chose that. And as parents saw how well that was working, and there were some uh, school districts who said, you know, they looked at the uh, assessment data as it was coming through and teacher may test and say, this family, this child really needs to get back to school. So there's been a lot of communication between the school, teachers, principals, and families encouraging, if possible, for the students to come back. So I think um, we do have some students who blossomed virtually. There's some who really did well, but overall, no. And we know that those who were virtual, not able to be with a teacher, particularly if they were students who were struggling before the pandemic, virtual was not the best option for them. So yes, there are going to be some students who have more significant loss, but there's some who had a pretty normal year as far as face time with teachers. So you can't say a blanket statement that, you know, it's been a lost year. Uh, obviously, for some, uh, we've got some significant work to do. I would think that our virtual education program, because we did have virtual education before the pandemic mm -hmm. for some select students, I would think that this experiment or this, this, this happening <laughs> has actually edified our sense of the virtual education process. We've learned and, a lot. Yeah. We've learned a lot. Um, there were districts uh, who were very well prepared, who had already trained their teachers. How do you do it well? How do you engage students? How do you check on students? How, you know, uh, so they were very well prepared. We had to do additional professional development with our teachers to help them get better at it. Um, and again, there's some students who thrived. Um, so virtual will always be there. And families across South Carolina have, for the last several years, had virtual options for free at their fingertips. We have five virtual charter schools that are open for enrollment, uh, and many districts offered virtual academies. And we have Virtual SC, which is a program here at the Department of Education that's been in place for a good while. Uh, the fifth largest virtual program in the United States offered free to all students, uh, public school students, private, and homeschool students. So we saw a tremendous leap in enrollment in our virtual SC program. Mostly high school class work, some middle school, and we're expanding that to be another resource for our schools as we move forward. We'll have more from Superintendent Spearman a little later on. Next, however, we'll visit one of the many amazing teachers who went the extra mile for her students during the pandemic. Kathleen Smith is a first grade teacher at Hunt Meadows Elementary School in Anderson School District 1. After the COVID-19 pandemic started, the school district established a virtual learning academy where Ms. Smith has been able to adapt to all the changes. At the same time, she's dedicated herself to making virtual learning as close as possible to face-to-face -face learning. Last year, when the pandemic started, I clearly remember coming into our building and it was just so quiet. You know, there were no children here and we had one day for us to get everything ready to prepare for the children virtually. We really worked as a great team. We put together packets that we thought were really important. We made sure we had some books for the children, and we made sure they all had everything they needed. And um, I was very impressed as a faculty how dedicated we were and how quickly we assimilated to this new method. reading coaches established all our routines. They figured out exactly how we were going to schedule each day, the pacing guides of how we're going to approach everything. And then we had this amazing team of IT. They came in and they trained all of us. And so with that support system, I could really just go ahead and rock and roll through the year. It was an incredible experience. So we would do that just to get you to know each other's names. Amari Yer, I was very impressed because we never did that with you. Ooh. 
was really important to me at first was making a connection to the children. I made up songs and little ditties every single month. So like for September and October, it was more about learning our names from each other. Like this month, you know, I was talking about good morning, good morning. And then they would say their own little things. It's great, I lost a tooth. And there'd be like a little opportunity for them to sing it and tell us something new that happened to them that night. And you'd be surprised at how that just brings them right into activity and how they want to learn. I also make sure I follow all the lessons that we normally have in a face-to-face -face setting. And we have this wonderful program where we do mini lessons. It's for reading. Get to your books and I can't wait to see you. I share, I demonstrate with them and how you approach this reading strategy or a comprehension strategy. And then I literally have them go into their own little individualized rooms. And I kind of pop in trying to get to as many children as I can. And then we come out and I pop them into their own partnerships. Then what they do is they practice that with each other. Double, double compound. Anything we did, like I modeled it for them. I would show them seriously how it's done, but then I think they learn even better when I'm a goofball. And I'm like, should I be doing this when my friend is reading? You know, and I'm just like sitting there and doing different things or I really demonstrate and model it for them. And so that's just one model. Then we use the same model for phonics, for writing, and then boom, they go and they write. They'll show me, they're like, sometimes they get stuck on words. I'm like, you know what? Get your beautiful creative um, thoughts down on paper. We can worry about what it smelled later. And they finally are starting to believe me. And a similar model again then for math. Zero, the hero, saves this place So all the other numbers can stay in their place Yeah. Just really a wonderful experience to see them do pretty much everything we do in class. I have to deliver 20 books per child every two weeks. We want to make sure they have books in hand because if they're in school face to face, they're having so such access to so many different books in our classrooms. I am supposed to deliver to three different schools within my school district, and it was a bit daunting. And I had this incredible friend who kept asking me every year, hey, do you need any help? She comes in every two weeks. You know, because usually you're here at school. You know exactly what you need, and she was trying to think of everything she was going to need for the whole two weeks. It was a lot to take on. We sit there trying to figure out, hmm, Okay, this is more nonfiction this week. Let's try to find more nonfiction books. Oh, wait a minute, we're in the fiction unit. Because the children are our future. And if I help her, it's gonna take the stress off of her. She's gonna be able to help the children more. It was a little bit harder for the families at first. I was very concerned about them. It was a lot for them to learn. From 7.30 in the morning until two o'clock, 2.15 in the afternoon, this is my full-time job. They are right there helping them to be ready and prepared to go for it for the school day. And it's not just the parents. I mean, it is grandparents. It is siblings, older siblings. I really don't even know if it really, truly can happen without their support. The communication is way better, vastly better in virtual learning. Every time my daughter has a need, it's met, like immediately. You know, they're learning to read and write and spell. So the biggest reward is just being able to watch that take place. This year has proven that my daughter is gonna do great and it's all because of the wonderful teachers that she's had this year. That's been very rewarding for both my daughter and me. So during this new pandemic, I realized what the true essence oh my God, of it is love. And, um, you know, you love these kids. Sorry. And, um, you know, they're right here on my shoulders. They're right here in my heart. <laughs> so I would go to the end of the world for them. When we couldn't see those babies, like boom, one day they're not there. And we didn't get to maybe see them again. And I just needed to see them one more time. Even if it was, you know, we're giving each other an air hug from across. 
You know, I just want them to know I'm still their cheerleader. And for these children, well, they may not have me like right there next to them, reading with them or really riding with them on a, um, you know, hearing those beautiful thoughts and showing them how much they're progressing. I miss that. I miss that, you know, where I can really just say, yay, you know, just be right there with them. But what this pandemic reminded me, hey, if I don't make that strong relationship with a child, if I don't reach them somehow, then how can learning even take place? So, you know, they'll only been alive six or seven years. And so we need to really look at them as the whole person. You know, what coping skills can I help them with? What, you know, did they have enough to eat today? You know, in the end, that's more, even more important. During the 2021 school year, the pandemic became a formidable opponent for high school athletics across the state. While our neighboring state, North Carolina, canceled all fall sports, the South Carolina High School League worked with school districts to formulate a plan to successfully complete this much appreciated school activity. High school sports on pause for many of our local school districts, and that is wearing on some local coaches and players. Our Matt Harris explains why they are feeling now at such a disadvantage. Several head coaches in CMS tell me they're frustrated. They've been told by the State High School Athletic Association plans on moving forward with their programs all depend on North Carolina moving into phase three. And right now, it isn't clear when that will happen. Fall sports faced serious challenges in the 2020-2021 academic year, with many states hitting the pause button on athletic competition. But here in South Carolina, it was game on, as the high school league, school districts, and coaches came together to create a plan for a safe and successful season. With this pandemic, it has forced us to uh, minimize the number of athletes you can have on, on the field at one time, or in a facility, say for instance, like the weight room, where you can't have a spotter. Um, so we really have to be strategic on how we're gonna get the work done. To begin with is, is a challenge. Um, not knowing how many kids we will get, not knowing how the season will go, but um, as we got closer and as we got in debt with it, it became pretty much a lot easier. Making sure that temperature was correct, making sure that they're washing their hands, making sure they're not sharing no water at all, we as coaches, we pretty much giving them the water at all times, making sure that they're washing their hands and just making sure that their temperature is good, so. You can even start in the summer. You know, we didn't have spring practice. Normally we're used to having spring practice the month of May. Um, our summer workouts were completely different. Uh, we never went inside. Uh, we didn't feel like we could adequately clean, clean the weight room with the supplies that we had. So we stayed outside. Uh, we stayed in pods of seven at two different locations. So all summer long, I'm in a car just driving. I didn't work with any kids, but more than five minutes, because I'm driving to the different locations, trying to keep the group small, trying to keep everything. So just from a preparation standpoint. Uh, then when we started the season, our first scrimmage was canceled. Uh, our school district didn't feel like we could play anybody on the outside yet, so, so we lost a scrimmage. Uh, not to mention, we only had 10 practices leading into our first game. Um, but the most important thing is keeping the kids healthy, keeping the coaching staff healthy, and keeping them on the field so they have something to look forward to. The challenges last year were, were great because of COVID. First and foremost, practicing with masks on. That was, that was different um, because they're out of breath and you see them um, getting gassed a whole lot faster than they normally would uh, without their masks. But, um, as a program, we knew that making sure not only the kids were safe, but the staff is safe, not only are the kids and the staff safe, but their families are safe as well. We took temperatures every single day. We asked them every single practice, um, have you been around someone who's uh, 
had COVID? Have you been exposed in any way uh, for the safety of our kids? Um, we did 15 minute increments of physical activity. So stunting, we would go 15 minutes, then we would take a break and do something else so that they can kind of recover. Because again, we're practicing with mask on and limited air, you know? Um, so just making sure that we're taking care of them physically because they had less time to get conditioned for going hard. COVID uh, definitely took us by, I mean, I'm pretty sure everywhere by storm, the athletic world for sure, but we figured out a way to still make, make sure that sports went on. Um, just reiterating to the athletes about social distancing, about keeping their masks going, about monitoring their activities outside of Keenan so that we could still have, um, you know, sports. Our concerns were one, how can we have athletics when schools weren't in session? And we understood that and we had a long discussion about that. And two, the safety, is it really safe for our student athletes? Um, and how are we gonna maintain the separation? How are we gonna maintain that our coaches and everyone's following the procedures and the recommendations by DHEC and the South Carolina High School League? And of course, the recommendations and expectations of Richland District 1. So we kind of walked everybody through, this is what we're gonna do. We screened our athletes, we screened our coaches every day um, with temperature check and COVID questionnaire and, and monitored them every day and, and documented that. And so we were real happy with how the season went. We were able to get through the season. We did lower the number of games that they played. We went to the smaller schedules, the shorter seasons. Um, and that worked out well for us. I think our biggest success is that our kids have played sports and stayed relatively healthy. And we've had a, a, you know, a great showing in the athletic aspect of high school league sports. Well, it's great to be here with Mr. Singleton. He's commissioner of the South Carolina High School League. And, you know, the pandemic has really changed some things. That goes without saying, but athletics in particular, high school athletics got shaken up. There were some changes put in place, but we managed. What was the plan, you know, starting out the 2020-2021 school year, what was the plan going into that? The pandemic had been going on for a few moments, a few months rather, you know, going into this previous school year, what, what did the plan look like? Well, our healthcare professionals says you don't just go from zero to 100. You had to take your time and ease your way into it. So we were able to roll out sports, one or two sports at a time and ease our way into it. We were fortunate. We got into the fall, we were able to have contests, and, and the last thing we even considered whether we were gonna have spectators there. And we found a way that we can even allow spectators to be there. Because the major cry was, let's just give the kids a chance to play, even if no spectators can be involved. That was the major cry, and we wanted to make sure we took care of that. But we were able to do both. We were, allowed to, we were able to allow spectators to attend. Although limited in numbers, they were allowed to be in attendance. And I think we gave us a great start. In our next episode, we'll continue our conversation with Superintendent Spearman and we'll visit some of the unsung heroes of our educational system. For more stories about our state and of course more details on the stories you've just seen, do visit our website at palmettoscene.org. And of course, don't forget to follow us on social media, whether Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. It's at SCETV, hashtag Palmetto Scene. For all of us here at Palmetto Scene, I'm Beryl Dakers. Good night, stay strong, and thanks for watching.